In this talk, I want to step back from the detailed discussions that we've had so far and look at kinship systems in general and their distribution over space and time. And firstly, perhaps we can look at our own system, since we've been looking at others. When one says one's own system and talks about Western industrial systems, of course one is leaping across vast differences between different classes, between different parts of the Western world, between different ethnic groups. But overlooking these differences, what are the main features of the dominant culture in Western industrial societies in terms of their kinship system and in terms of what we've discussed? Well, the descent system is cognatic. There is an absence of clans and lineages, hence the need to invent these terms. We have a network of ties rather than formal groups. Our inheritance system is one where personal inheritance is relatively unimportant and most of what we live off is provided through the state and through wider systems. Our terminology is the Eskimo one which differentiates our, at the nuclear family. Our marriage choice system is based as on a contract between two consenting adults who have chosen each other. It's based on love and not on marriage, or not on arranged marriage, and it's what's known as a complex system. The marriage economics in our society don't place a great stress on dowry and bride wealth, and the sums that are paid at marriage are often very small. We have this peculiar demographic structure of selective marriage, marriage as a choice, and late age at marriage, relatively late. We don't tend to have multiple marriages. We have serial polygamy. We successively marry a number of people, but we don't marry more than one person at a time. And we don't have widow inheritance. We have a household structure of a very simple kind, with one or two parents living with young children and the children leave home young. Parental power is not very great in our society. We don't have patriar potestas, the power of the father of a kind that is found in many traditional societies, and children more or less can do what they like, up to a point, of course, but the parents don't have great economic or any other kind of sanction over their children. Our sexual and gender relations are such we stress equality between the sexes, at least as an ideal and there is little opposition between males and females of an honor and shame kind. Other features, we don't have ancestor cults, we don't have a great interest in our line, and we tend to treat our old with not a great deal of esteem, and we abandon the sick and the old into institutions. This can all be summed up in an account of American kinship by David Schneider, when he says the kinship systems of modern Western societies are relatively highly differentiated as compared with the kinship systems found in many primitive and peasant societies. By differentiated, I mean simply that kinship is clearly and sharply distinguished from all other kinds of social institutions and relationships. In many primitive and peasant societies, a large number of different kinds of institutions are organized and built as parts of the kinship system itself. Thus, the major social units of the society may be kin groups, lineages, perhaps. These same kin groups are also the property-owning units, the political units, the religious units. All these different spheres interact with kinship. Kinship is the way of articulating politics, religion, economics, and society. Thus, whatever a man does in such a society, he does so according to some rule of succession, inheritance, or descent. But in the United States, all of these institutions are quite clearly differentiated from each other. One is supposed to earn one's political office by election. One owns property in one's own right and enters into economic relations where one chooses, so that one has the differentiation which many sociologists have noticed as a feature of modern society. Kinship has been separated off and no longer holds everything together. How did this happen and when did it happen? In looking at this, we need perhaps to look more widely at the distribution in space of different kinds of kinship systems. Our system, a cognatic system, 
is mainly found throughout the globe on islands. The major examples are Japan, Java, England, the Philippines, parts of Borneo, parts of New Guinea, the Andaman Islanders, or on the edges of continents, as with the Eskimos. It also tends to be found, strangely, in the most inhospitable of climates, in deserts, for example, the Kung and the Hadza um, hunters and gatherers. There are various theories as to why cognatic systems like this tend to be either on islands or in inhospitable climes. They are systems which are very flexible. They provide um, a network of relatives on whom you can call, but not fixed demands and fixed groups. And this is useful in difficult areas. It's a suitable system for people who tend to need to move with their resources, hunters and gatherers, who cream off surpluses, who are in many ways at the mercy of their environment. And in a curious way, in industrial societies, we are also in this highly mobile situation and at the mercy of the market. Thus, it's perhaps not just um, a coincidence that at the two extremes, in the simplest hunters and gatherers and at the most technologically advanced societies, have this kind of flexible cognatic system. The very strong, solid block-like structures, the unilineal descent groups, are found in all types of pre-industrial economy, but they occur most frequently in pastoral and ag agricultural communities, and mon only marginally in hunting and gathering, and, of course, in industrial societies. Extensive lineage ties are especially significant where population is fairly sparse, where what you're trying to do is control human beings and labor, and you're trying to hold them together. In such societies where you have sparse population, where the state is non-existent or very weak indeed, where the market and the economy is not developed, their kinship dominates and holds everything together, and you need a very strong structure, and there you find these unilineal descent systems. These are basically the middle range societies lying between the two extremes. If one asks where one is likely to find the two major types of unilineal descent system, matrilineal and patrilineal, matrilineal systems tend to be associated with certain kinds of agriculture, particularly with horticulture, uh, rather than with other types, for example, pastoralism. So you find matrilineal systems in horticultural and fishing communities, those using hoes and swidden cultivation, that is, slash and burn, for example, the Trobriand Islands or the Khasis of Assam. In these society, you find um, pa uh, matrilineal systems. Where you have pastoralism, herding, and often rather um, war-prone societies, there you tend to find patrilineal society. In fact, David Abley has put forward the famous remark that the cow is the enemy of matriliny and the friend of patriliny. You hardly ever, if ever, get matrilineal society which is concerned with pastoral nomadic production. So you tend to find patrilineal societies mainly among animal herders and in plough societies, for example, in the great civilizations of China and India. But the association, of course, as with all these generalizations, is not perfect since culture is extremely tenacious. Three examples of counter-instances may be given. The Navajo Indians have been horticulturalists and matrilineal. Then, in the 17th century, they became a pastoral people, keeping sheep. Yet they remained, in the words of Robert Lowy, obstinately matrilineal. They refused to change their kinship system with their economic production. Other societies have without changing their mode of production, changed from one to the other. The Shoshone Indians have changed from patriliny to matriliny without any obvious economic change. They just opted to change. You get other kinds of instances. The Hopi Indians came into contact with the Spaniards in 1540, but they are still organized now into matrilineages, despite huge changes in their world. Likewise, the old system of the Iroquois Indians has weathered French, English, and American influence in the heart of New York State and remained uh, in the same system. 
take another example, our own system, our own cognatic system, can be traced back to Anglo-Saxon roots and basically is the same in terms of descent, terminology, inheritance, as it was a thousand years ago, having weathered such minor turbulences as the change from Catholicism to Protestantism, the rise and emergence of capitalism, the Industrial Revolution, the Urban Revolution, and yet we have in many ways a similar uh, kinship system to our Anglo-Saxon forebears. This term brings us to the final question of the changes over time of kinship systems. The major finding here is that large block-like systems formed by unilineal descent groups tend to get eroded by the more flexible and more network-like systems such as our own. What tends to happen is that the functions carried out by these blocks tend to be taken over by other institutions. For example, the deprivation of the political and administrative functions seems to have under undermined the patric lands of ancient Rome, of the Zulus, and of China. As the central administration became more effective as justice was administered from the middle, then the role of the clan and the lineage was undermined. For example, homicide began to be dealt with in the king's court rather than by the rules of the blood feud dictated by kinship. Again, economic changes, the rise of wage labor and cash cropping breaks up the interdependent ties between kin in matrilineal societies. For example, as described for the Nayas of South India by Elizabeth Goff, you no longer need to rely on your kin for help in production and distribution of goods. And so you, the, the market integrates you in a new way and kinship falls away. Residential associations are also broken up by migrant labor. Members of the family move away, can earn wages, and no longer are dependent on their parents. Social and spatial mobility, individual ownership, and the written will, which allows you to disinherit your children, the rise of insurance facilities, which makes it no longer to absolutely essential to have children, no longer absolutely essential to look after your old. The rise of banks. All these things break up unilineal descent groups and the peasant family. Whereas the agnatic systems was a powerful force in law and defense, a predatory military organization, as Marshal Salins has described it, for waging war, many of these societies built up their defense systems through their kinship system. Whereas the matrilineal system, according to Mary Douglas, was efficient in spreading risks in uh, simple economic systems where the harvests were perishable and irregular. In such societies, these difficulties are now dealt with by other forces. So that gradually, you seem to get the erosion, the growth of the Western family model over much of the world. Thus, Hobel, for example, the anthropologist, writes that the clan, the proudest and the most powerful social institution among the higher primitives, disappears from civilized society. It was supplanted by the national state, which suppressed the clan and brought internal order. A classic example would be the destruction of the clan system in 18th century Scotland. Another would be the destruction of the peasant economy, which prevailed over much of Western Europe, even until the end of the 19th century, but with the rise of nationalism and the nation state has more or less disappeared. But again, rather than thinking of a straight evolution, life is not as simple and as uniform as this. Lineage ties still remain extremely important, even in urban and industrial settings in India, Africa, and even in Europe. The famous Chinese lineages in the new territories of Canton have flourished and expanded with Western methods. They may jet around from place to place and have multi-million pound dealings in oil and um, airlines, but they still base this on a lineage system. The Cosa Nostra and the Mafia still operate through the family in organized crime. And Cocoa farming in Ghana, as Polly Hill has shown, is still based on matrilineal kin groups. In 
conclusion, there is no irreversible process and no predictable future of clan organizations and the change from unilineal descent groups to our flexible cognatic system. One can't, as an anthropologist, predict what will be happening when people watch this film in 100, 200 years. By that time, they may have adopted a Delphic polyandry. They may have the institution of the couvard, that is, institution people, husbands um, going through birth pains when their wife goes through birth pains, which is a widespread institution. They may be marrying each other before uh, they're born. One can't tell. At that time, it will be refreshing for an anthropologist to look back and look at the predictions I've made here. What one can say, though, is that at the moment there seems to be an erosion, rather like um, detergents erode oil throughout the world. The Western family models, along with um, Western industrial and other models, are spreading and eroding many of the traditional family systems.